Okay, now let's talk about chords with more than ninths, let's say the 11th and 13th chords, okay? So now we're up to the point where we have all or almost all the notes in the scale all sounding at the same time. The important thing to remember is that the more notes you have in a chord, especially the more different pitches, the more the inertia of the chord increases. It's harder and harder for the ear to sense any direction because all the notes are conflicting with each other. So when you have too many harsh dissonances together, which happens very easily in 11th and 13th chords, it saturates, it confuses the texture, and it, the result is that it, it's, it's the kind of sonority that's not useful for very long. Uh, for a short time, it can be interesting, but after a while, it just gets gray. Uh, let's look at example eight here. First chord, second chord, okay. In both of these chords, what I've done is, so what we end up hearing is, in effect, is one triad and another triad on top. Well, where's it going? Same thing with the second one. The specific triads aren't the same, but the result is the same. These are chords that have an interesting color occasionally, but as far as creating any sense of direction, would anybody like to suggest where that should go? Not exactly obvious. Okay, again, the 13th chords, since they include all seven notes of the scale, can be used occasionally to collect all the notes into a kind of climactic accent. Here's an example. Let's listen to example nine. Example nine starts off, then gradually thickens. last chord, which is a very thick chord indeed, but as a sort of climax it could work. I don't think I want a whole piece worth of that though. Okay, as I mentioned at the beginning, also let's remember that as the number of notes gets larger, the idea of inversion has less and less meaning, because there's so many different possible spacings, not all of which put any emphasis at all on thirds. For example, if we take all the diatonic notes stacked in thirds and in fourths, are they really heard as inversions of the same 11th chord? That's the kind of question that theoretically sounds very fine, but in practice it means nothing. When, when you listen to a triad and its inversion, they're quite audibly part of the same, uh, same group or they belong in the same family. When we listen to, let's say, this and this, not so clear that they belong to the same family. So the more notes you have, the more the exact spacing matters and the less the theoretical root. Okay, with these very thick kind of chords, the big problem tends to be how to lighten them up, how to lighten the texture. There are lots of ways you can do this. The first example is example 10A. Here what we're doing is, instead of making the whole chord sound harmonically at once, the melody includes the 11th. That way, instead of having quite as many notes sounding at the same time, by passing one of them over melodically, it lightens up the texture. So that's one possibility for lightening up. Another thing, another possibility, very, very common, is to leave out some notes. Let's listen to example 10b. Here, the chord in full would be, but here it's, so we have, actually what amounts to a 13th chord here but with three notes left out then resolving into a seventh chord which resolves into another seventh chord the seventh chords comparatively speaking are less tense which creates a sort of cadence here which is what we want example 10c it illustrates a lot of the same thing most of the time here you'll see that the chords are given as arpeggios and there are often elements missing let's listen to 10c So just as an example, well actually that could be thought of as all that, but here we just have that, 
and by using it as an arpeggio, and then the next one, similarly, manages to keep the texture light. Another important thing with this kind of texture, which even with the omissions is still fairly dense, notice that I use the top line to create a sense of direction G, then G, F, A, then in the third bar we head up to B in the soprano, then go down G, F, D, E, C, A. In other words, there's a rising contour and then a falling contour. Notice how the cadence is done. The fallen register at the end, and the fact also that the chord is less dense, this is just the ninth chord, enables the cadence to feel somewhat relaxed compared to the rest of it. So this is a typical kind of example of using these chords in, a, in context, where, as I say, the main problem is lightening them up. Except for occasional accents, they're not much use consistently over a long section. It tends to get very heavy and very gray very easily. Okay, another aspect of using these chords is once you get into thicker textures, some of the notes will be doubled. Depending which note is doubled, the effect can be quite different. In example 10D, the first example written down, the note that's doubled here is the root, the E. Now compare the other chord in 10D where the doubling is the ninth. Notice that the second spacing sounds less stable than the first one does. That's because of the note which is doubled. If you double the root or the fifth, generally the chord will sound more solid and more grounded. If you double the third or the seventh, it's going to be more dense. And the same thing for the ninth. It creates tension as a whole. In the occasional examples in music where we get pile of thirds beyond the eleventh and the thirteenth, in other words, we could keep going by making them chromatic. Like that, so we don't come on the same notes the same way. They tend to be used mainly as a percussive effect. There's an example right at the beginning of the Ravel of Vos Nobles Sentimentale, where he has just a bunch of notes that are kind of a cluster together, but that kind of thing, nobody's intended to notice all the details of the distance. It's just sort of a accent, an accent in the higher register. Sometimes in these situations, by the way, the notes which have been omitted can be used very effectively in the following harmony. For example, if you have what amounts to a cluster chord with eight different notes in it, the note which wasn't there sometimes is a very effective contrast in the following chord. If you carry this principle all the way, in other words, if we keep going up in thirds, or for that matter in fourths or, or at other interval, eventually we get to 12 note chords. As we will see uh, in coming lessons, 12 note chords have a sort of special place but since they contain every single note in the chromatic scale, the one thing we can say for sure about them is their effect depends entirely on the spacing. Because in principle, this is the same thing as and so on, all the way up. So as you can see, the spacing makes all the difference. Again, these 12 note extremely dense chords tend to be useful only for a fairly short period of time, just because of their sheer heaviness. One thing you can do with such chords to create a bit more sense of anchoring, even with chords that aren't that thick, is put the fifth on the bottom. Look at example 11. Or let's say in the first ending. So I end up on a seventh chord. That fifth on the bottom gives a kind of solidity at the end. Same thing in number two. Generally speaking, the wider spacing creates more clarity as a rule, considering there are lots of notes in these chords. The last application for these chords is a specific kind of parallel writing that we see sometimes. In other words, here we're using 7th, 9th, or 11th chords just in parallel with each other. Let's listen to example 12a. In example 12a, we see an interesting way to use these chords in parallel. Only at the cadence is there any real independence. The result is that the parallel chords are less dense because we're not following a lot of different voice leading. They're basically like one line fattened up. Only at the cadence do things change. 
we sense a real sense of, there's a real feeling of harmonic movement to the cadence. Same thing with 12b. Here again we have two parallel chords, and in the cadence, the top part continues to be parallel, but the bass takes a new turn. Again we have that fifth underneath at the end, which helps to anchor the resulting sonority. Those are exact parallels, but parallels can be either diatonic or exact. Let's listen to example 13. In example 13, essentially I've taken a D major scale and moved the parallels according to the D major scales, which gives us... So here we have the fifth underneath a major triad, then a fifth underneath a minor triad, then a major triad, then a minor triad. So that gives you a certain variety of color that you don't get when they're exact parallel. So that can be an interesting way to do this sort of texture and still have some variety. If you look at example 14, which basically has exact parallels, except for the end, the need for, for the change at the end is precisely for the cadence. So let's listen again to example 14. <laughs> 